caught up with some of your peers earlier in the week uh, at a banking conference, and the tone there was very, very positive on the U.S. consumer, perhaps less so, but coming off the lows for corporate uh, sentiment. Is, is that how you see things at the moment? It's, I mean, it's hard to argue with it. We've got 50-year unemployment lows. Uh, consumer balance sheets are in good shape. Uh, and obviously the corporate sector, you know, after the tax cut, there was a major surge. A uh, little bit of trepidation coming out of the summer with the trade talks escalating and the election, you know, discussions obviously creating more uh, uncertainty. So I think the corporate sector has, has come off the boil a little bit. Uh, consumer remains very strong. So, yeah, I saw those interviews and, and I would agree with them. Do you feel like this phase one trade deal that we've been discussing uh, all day on CNBC, does that drastically improve the outlook for the corporate sector next year? No. No, drastic. It would take a lot more for a drastic improvement. And listen, it's good we got a deal, looks like, or at least some uh, resetting. But I think we'll, we're going to be talking about this for 10 years. There are, there are going to be dozens of deals done over the next 10 years. In terms of China's outlook for the year ahead, are you optimistic that it can help uh, their economy as well? Well, China, you know, China needs to keep growing. And uh, in aggregate terms, I think it accounts for something like 40 percent of global growth. Um, it's a $12 trillion economy, so percentage-wise it's slowing a little bit, but it needs to keep growing, and part of that growth is to have trade uh, taking place with the major industrialised and consumer nations. So the Chinese need this as much as the Americans need it. Uh, earlier this week, my colleague David Reed from CMC.com uh, had a story that said you guys were making quite a few job cuts. Uh, gauge for us whether that is because you're perhaps increasingly bearish about next year or if it's part of the usual churn. Um, you know, it's a it'll, little bit of caution. We're, we're later in the cycle. Um, we've had a terrific run for the last several years. We've had strong growth. And this was a time to sort of reset the table a little bit. So part of it was that. Part of it was a lot of the investments we made post becoming a bank uh, in our infrastructure have now become business as usual. So we're able to cut back on some of those investments. But listen, I, you know, I, I, have, I hate going through these exercises. I obviously feel tremendously for the folks uh, who are affected by it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was something like 2% of our employees year over year. So, you know, it's a big number of individuals. And at a personal level, it's obviously, you know, a really big event. Uh, but for Morgan Stanley is in the aggregate. Uh, it's, it's, it's just prudent, you know. On, on the Fed, uh, when we sat down for our last interview in June, you said, uh, quote, I personally would be more conservative in cutting rates because I don't think you want to use your firepower too early. So presumably you disagree with the cuts we've seen since then? Listen, the market priced in those cuts. I think there was enough uncertainty in August in particular, uh, September, where at least a cut was deserved. Uh, I think we're about right now. I, I don't see the, the need for the... It's hard to argue with inflation where it is, with unemployment where it is, with GDP growth where it is, for further rate cuts. So, yeah, I would, I would hold, the, hold whatever firepower remains, and I think that's what the Board of Governors just said. Um, if we get into some more uh, Morgan Stanley specifics, are, are you sure. prepared now for a period of, of elevated competition and, and with it pressure on margins within wealth management, whether that's because of the broker price wars, the consolidation of Schwab TD, some reorganizations from your rivals, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs? Yeah, this has been an industry which I've obviously worked in and been part of for uh, several decades now. There's always competition, right? It's all, there's always something going on. Uh, the electronic trading going to zero pricing uh, on the equity streets, uh, that was coming, right? That was inevitable. Uh, no, we're, we, we have the advantage of being the scale player, one of the couple of scale players in the industry. We can make the investments in the technology and the infrastructure you need to be world-class and competitive. And I think game on. I mean, it's not surprising to me others are waking up that wealth management is a phenomenal business. If this recent price war, and you mentioned you guys have the scale to invest in the technology, if it was sparked by the likes of Robinhood entering, who are the ultimate winners? Weirdly, has it kind of played into your hands a little bit? Well, it depends on the client segment. I've always said if you've got, you know, $30,000, you don't and shouldn't have a financial advisor. You shouldn't have a complex portfolio. You should be invested in an index fund. Uh, if you've got $30 million, it's an entirely different ball of wax. And we have over a trillion dollar of assets with clients who have at least $10 million just with us. So they've got multiples of that in their, in their net worth. So, you know, the winners are built around who is the best in class at whatever the vertical you're working in. In our case, full financial advice, workplace marketing through the Solim acquisition. That's where we want to be best in class. Um, in terms of uh, how your clients feel at the moment, do you, do you think they've got 
large amounts of risk still to put on the table or are they fully invested? No, definitely not fully invested, have not been very active for several years. I've been honestly surprised at how muted the trading activity has been among the retail client base. There's some sign that's picking up a little bit. I think the trade news, as we get closer to the election, um, the vote in the UK, I'm sure we'll talk about that. All of these uncertainties, as they start to fall away, the individual gathers their confidence. And I, I, I think that's what we're starting to see. There was a vote in the UK? Joking. We'll come back to that a little bit later. In terms of, uh, you meant, we mentioned Schwab TD. Uh, they, Schwab has clearly swooped for TD whilst they were at a depressed price. There are some other players out there at depressed prices. Have you considered any of them to help expand your scale? We, we love the business we're in and what we're doing. I mean, we, we always look at strategic stuff. That's what you're supposed to do. But we don't, we don't do it based upon a point-in-time pricing transaction. We, do, we make our strategic choices based on where we want the company to be, you know, 10, 20 years from now. That's why we bought Smith Barney back in 2009. We believe the wealth management space was compelling. We wanted scale. We moved quickly. Are you an admirer of uh, E-Trade's corporate stock plan business? They have a very good stock plan business. Yeah, they do. And they've done a very nice job with that. Um, you know, Fidelity has a great plan business. There are others out there in the marketplace. And as I said, we bought Solium, now uh, renamed Shareworks at Morgan mm -hmm. Stanley. And it's, it's great. It's a great way to reach individuals through the workplace. So you'll stick with, with what you've got already in that space? Well, we love, organically. We love, yeah, we love what we're doing. We're building organically. We're winning business through it. It's mm -hmm. been, honestly, it's been, I think this will go down... It was a relatively small transaction. We paid a lot for it at the time. It was considered expensive for what it was. I think it will go down as a total home run. Uh, I want to talk about the WeWork IPO, if I may. And, and you guys had been touted as likely to be one of the leads on that IPO and then didn't end up being a part of the S1 when it was filed. Yeah. Why, why not? Well, I can't, obviously, and you, you know I can't talk about an individual transaction. Um, were there so, aspects uh, about it that you guys were put off by, that the, the valuation was too rich or the corporate governance wasn't good enough? You know, I, I, again, it wouldn't be fair for me to go into that, but clearly there was a misalignment between how a lot of, um, uh, a lot of private securities were being priced at and what, the, what the, the public money actually wants to pay for it. That's what the IPO process is. It's, it's what you guys do. It's what happens on the exchange floor every day. It's finding transparency, matching the buyers and sellers. What founders want to sell their company at, what buyers are prepared to sell at, can be very at odds at different points in the cycle, and I think that's what happened in that case. Do you think it's marked a turning point where corporate governance will now have to be better before an S1 is filed? Valuations will have to be a little bit more reasonable? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. I mean, there, there are always there are cycles, and you get these spurts of um, sort of, well, Greenspan said it best, right, irrational exuberance. Mm -hmm. uh, we had it in 99 going into uh, that time period there. We had it back in 85, 86. Uh, there are these corrections. And I think we've had a little bit of that with some of these companies. I mean, it, you better have a very, very compelling growth story if you're not making money, right? At some point, long-only investors want to know that the company is around for the long term is making money. And I think there's been some reassessment from that. Um, switching focus, I understand that you had dinner with Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon uh, at a restaurant in the West Village uh, called Don Angie on the 14th of November. What were you guys discussing? That's Business or pleasure? That's hilarious. <laughs> is it true? Were you at the restaurant? I wasn't, but one of my colleagues was. Oh, there's no hiding in the city. Is, is there a merger coming? No. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, no, that'd be great. That, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, yes, David, there will. No, David's a great guy. Um, when he became CEO, I called him, and as Lloyd did to me when I became CEO, we're, we're competitors, but we, we, we have a lot of things we have to share in common. And we said, let's get together for dinner. And uh, he, actually, he actually picked a restaurant where the maitre d' is an Aussie uh, from Tasmania, Damien, and it's one of my favorite places. We had a nice time. But, but I, this is fascinating to me. So you guys, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, as fierce a, a Wall Street investment bank com competitors as there are, but, but you're also mates off, off, off the kind of Wall Street. Well, we're, we're, we're counterparties. We, we're, we're in a lot of transactions together. Um, we have great respect for each, each institution I have for their leadership. I've known their CEOs going back many years. Um, you know, you, you, listen, you compete, but you're not unfriendly. We, mm -hmm. we're, we both need both of us to succeed in this marketplace. It's important for, uh, for exchanges like this, for technical companies, uh, public. And the benefit of having a personal relationship is when things do happen between the institutions, it's a phone call, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a very simple phone call. And uh, I wish David well.
Um, one area where I guess you, you guys might see eye to eye is, is when uh, the political spectrum focuses on investment banks. And when we spoke uh, in June and I was asking about the spotlight, you said, quote, meaning banks, we're not the problem. And you went on to say in a political debate, somebody's always going to find somebody to be angry at. Sure. Six months ago, it felt like, in fact, tech was the focus. Do you think things have pivoted back and that Wall Street banks, as we go into an election year, are back in the crosshairs? I don't think so. I, you know, I think I think there are a lot of issues that that should be surfaced going, you know, and will be debated around um, not just the financial sector, the healthcare sector, technology sector, the energy sector. So no, corporations are part of the political dialogue. I don't think the banks in this particular cycle are especially prominent, nor should they be. Um, you mentioned the UK election uh, earlier. Does does that clear up whether or not Morgan Stanley wants to to remain based in London? We would always remain based in London. We've got 5,000 employees there. We've been there for, uh, I think, nearly 50 years. Uh, it's a huge operation. Uh, London is either number one or two most important financial centre, as you know, uh, in the world with New York. We're, that was never in question. We've moved um, a couple of hundred employees so far onto the continent. We might eventually move about 400 out of 5,000. Uh, I, I felt more for uh, the British economy to have clarity around the path forward with Brexit, to have a majority government that can be decisive, uh, a set of policies which I think will stand up for economic growth, I thought it was constructive. And so you could see that feed into a, a better European economy next year or just a, a UK-only economy? I think there's, st there's still... Wilf, I think they're still interrelated and mm -hmm. I think it's, what's good for the UK is going to be good for Europe. Let's talk about the stock price. Uh, we talked about this last time uh, as well. It's improved since the summer, particularly the last couple of months. Uh, but price to book value is still at or, or just above price to book. You set your ROE targets, double digit, you're confident in making them. I mean, if you do hit those targets for the next three, five years, yeah. do you think you'll get a much better multiple than you've had for the yeah. last 12 months? I mean, it's, it's, you know, the market's very short term can be quite irrational. Long term, uh, if you think the market's wrong, you're the problem, right? right. So it's like the fish and the poker game. Um, no, listen, our, our stock has had an incredible journey. We're an 80 billion plus dollar company. Uh, at one point in my tenure, I think we were down to, you know, 15 billion. Um, so you don't want to complain too much. But just rationally, the consistency of earnings, consistency of revenues, we'd never had a $10 billion quarter uh, before 2018. Five of the last seven, we've had over $10 billion revenues. And we'll see what happens uh, with Q4. The company's in great shape. I, I personally think the valuations are very low, but, you know, ultimately the market's the judge. Um, in terms of uh, the leadership, uh, your uh, number two, long-time number two, Colin Kelleher, uh, announced his retirement uh, earlier in the year. You haven't filled the president position yet. Where, where do we stand on that? Firstly, Colin did a phenomenal job for us, going back to the financial crisis, CFO through that, and as my president... Uh, just a great guy. You know, we've, through Morgan Stanley's history, we've had sole presidents, dual, and none. Right now, we have none. We have uh, a bunch of executives who I think are great leaders, and we're developing, and this is giving me a chance without having a president to work directly with them and get more exposure to them and, and really see what they can do, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And do you see yourself leading the company right through the next full economic cycle? Is that going to happen next week or <laughs> 10 years from now? It depends when the cycle is. Uh, listen, I love doing what I'm doing, uh, but I serve at the pleasure of the board. I want to develop a team to replace me. I've, I have no desire to be here when I'm 70 years old. I'm 61. I love it. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll retire when you do. OK, Pat, well, I, I intend to be working when I'm 61. It there means that, that's a little bit of a gap there. But, James, always a pleasure yeah. catching up. Thanks, Phil. Thanks so All much. Right. James Gorman, Thank the uh, chairman and CEO of Morgan Stanley.